I'm Haley B. Miller, and this is Ohio Politics Explained, a podcast where you give us 15 minutes and we give you all the news you need to sound smart and impress your friends. Welcome back to Ohio Politics Explained. Today, we'll discuss mass voter challenges, a Supreme Court ruling on animal abuse, why infant deaths are increasing, and how Ohio accidentally indicted a dead guy for illegal voting. Joining me today is Jesse Ballmer. Thanks for having me. Just a few more days until the election is over. Crazy. It's going to be here before we know it. A quick reminder, if you enjoy OPE, please consider sharing an episode with your friends and family or leaving us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Your support helps keep us going. Our first topic is these voter challenges. Ohio law allows you to contest another person's right to vote. Election officials say this is basically a supplement to routine voter roll maintenance that is really just used on occasion, until this year, at least. Counties across Ohio have seen an uptick in challenges ahead of the November 5th election. We're talking hundreds, even thousands. Wood County alone fielded 17,000 of them. Give us a rundown on who's behind these challenges and why. Yeah, so there are are a number of groups that have kind of like educated individuals across the country on how to bring these voter challenges, kind of like a how-to guide, and really are just going about it that way. Are these... Are these more of a like conservative organization? Yeah, uh, one of the groups behind a lot of these challenges is called the Election Integrity Network. It's a national group that's run by a lawyer that helped Donald Trump contest the 2020 election results. There's also an Ohio version of it. And I think there are some other groups that have cropped up as well or kind of created these websites that allow people to comb data and essentially do their own research, but these websites are not complete data, which leads to a lot of inaccuracies. Like in Wood County, there were a couple elected officials who had their voter registration challenge. I was at the hearing and a county commissioner spoke and was basically like, yeah, I, I'm a voter. My name's on the plaque. Right. I thought that was such a fascinating anecdote. And it really shows the difference between kind of web or online research versus sometimes common sense in these things, you know, you'd want to double check that the county commissioner isn't someone you're trying to, you know, potentially boot from the voter rolls, for example, but really underscores this like spectrum we find ourselves on as a country. On one side, you have voter security. You don't want a bunch of people voting who aren't supposed to vote. But on the other end, you have voter access. And how do you make it easier for people to vote and not add hurdles that make it harder for particularly lower income or the individuals with less access to get to the ballot box? And so you're really seeing this pendulum swing one way or the other, usually along political lines. Yeah, and you have people like Secretary of State Frank LaRose and other election officials in Ohio who say you can do both. I will leave that up to the masses to debate, but I do think Ohio runs its elections fairly well for the most part, and the state has pretty aggressive voter roll maintenance that it does every year, so I would imagine there aren't an abundance of people on the rolls who aren't supposed to be, who haven't already gone through processes that are very much laid out in state law and by LaRose's office. Yeah, and I think your reporting kind of bore that out. There aren't a lot of these challenges that are being successful, especially compared to the number that are being brought forward. So it's interesting. It's also a decent amount of work for these county board of election officials who are very busy this time of year between early voting and campaign finance deadlines and so forth. So not that if there are valid claims, certainly they should do their do the work and do the job, but these are really burdening, pretty overburdened people already. Right. And some election officials I talked to thought that this issue was resolved, for lack of a better term, over the summer because a lot of these challenges cropped up then. But then Wood County, Lorain County, they got a bunch jumped on them like three days before early voting started. And at that point, election officials have a few things on their plate. Yeah, just a couple. 
All right. Now let's discuss why cats and dogs are amazing and people should not hurt them. The Ohio Supreme Court ruled this week that it's illegal to abuse a cat or dog, even if they're strays. This came about after a Cleveland man poured bleach on a kitten, then argued he should be charged with a misdemeanor instead of a felony. You know, strays have rights, too. Yeah, I guess we're aggressively pro-cat on this podcast. But uh, yeah, the legal argument that was being made here was really, is a cat or a dog a companion animal, even if they are a stray cat or dog? Or do they have to be a pet, one with a collar, living in someone's home and being regularly fed in order to qualify for this? That's because Ohio law increases the penalty for those companion animals. It could be considered a felony versus a misdemeanor for, you know, other types of animals who might be, you know, scurrying about your neighborhood. So ultimately, the Ohio Supreme Court unanimously decided that this should be a felony I listened to the oral arguments and it really became almost like a grammar lesson. And there was pretty bipartisan support that Ohio lawmakers could have written this law more clearly. I don't know if you're an expert on this law after writing about this one case, but you know, you mentioned that it was an issue about companion animals. I mean, can like, not that I'm suggesting anyone do this, but can you go pour bleach on a squirrel? I think in that scenario, it would be a misdemeanor offense versus a felony offense. So there are kind of like levels to this thing. And then you get into animals that people might hunt for sport or something like a deer. And certainly you're allowed to do that within certain seasons in Ohio. So it depends on the animal, depends on the circumstance a lot of time. Our third topic is a new study from Ohio State on infant deaths. Researchers looked at the 7 to 14 months after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in June of 2022. Nationwide, they found a 7% increase in infant mortality and a 10% increase in babies born with congenital anomalies. Does the study say what caused this, why this happened? Yeah, so I spoke with one of the researchers and they can't definitively say one of the theories that the professor, the researcher that I spoke with had was that people were having less access to health care, perhaps less testing for those congenital or chromosomal abnormalities. And so maybe these decisions would have either ended in an abortion before where there was less access to that or, you know, just things might have gone differently, but they don't have definitive data on that. This was uh, looking at numbers nationwide, and they saw that bump in the seven to 14 months after the U.S. Supreme Court decision on Roe v. Wade, and then it kind of leveled off after that. I know you talked to sort of advocates on both sides of the abortion debate, and it seemed like those who are in favor of abortion access were basically like, told you we knew this was going to happen. Yeah. So proponents of abortion access like Kelly Copeland from Abortion Forward were saying that there are consequences to abortion restrictions and abortion bans and that these are concerns that they have had for quite some time that it has an impact on, you know, parents in a variety of different ways. And what did we hear from I you talked to Aaron Bear with the Center for Christian Virtue. What was his response to the study? Yeah, so he called it one of the most callous studies that he had ever seen. The implication being that, you know, these children or, you know, infants or fetuses should have been aborted before they were born. Also, uh, proponents of abortion and abortion access, you know, say that abortion bans are saving lives because those are abortions that are not being performed in the state of Ohio. Let's wrap up today with some illegal voting indictments that were announced this week. Attorney General Dave Yost said six green card holders were charged with voting in prior elections despite not being U.S. citizens. This came after Secretary of State Frank LaRose referred hundreds of potential violations to Yost a couple months ago. But Yost got a pretty big surprise the day after his press conference. Turns out one of the people charged is dead. Yeah, good things to check before you indict someone generally. But um, I think uh, the Cuyahoga County prosecutor was quite 
I don't know, had an opinion on this topic, basically said that they would never indict a dead person and that this wasn't an appropriate role for a prosecutor to take. Uh, for The attorney general, for their part, said that if this person is dead, that they obviously would dismiss the charges against them. So it's it's interesting as we talk about cases of voter fraud being very rare, and then this led to six charges, and then maybe ultimately we'll only go forward with five charges out of this investigation. Yeah. And this topic of non-citizen voting, which is illegal and extremely rare, has been a big issue for Republicans ahead of the election. A lot of folks, including Senator J.D. Vance, are raising concerns about it and amplifying claims that really are not true. You know, he says that Democrats are trying to bring undocumented immigrants into the country so they can vote for Harris and win the election. And some voting rights groups are looking at all this and worry that Republicans are essentially laying the groundwork to kind of scapegoat immigrants if the election doesn't go their way in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's a combination of immigration being a key issue, particularly for Republican candidates. We saw that even going back to the whole situation in Springfield. And then also, it's hard to see how you would need to like lay a groundwork in a state like Ohio, where I think the expectation is that former President Donald Trump is going to do quite well here. But in swingier swing states, that that could be something that comes up. Yeah, it's interesting to see some of this discussion happening here. It's also happening in places like Pennsylvania and Arizona and Wisconsin, I think. But to your point, I don't think we're expecting a quite as heated of a presidential race as those other states. Yeah, I have not seen either presidential candidate in the Buckeye State, and that was a marked difference from previous years. And one more thing before you go. Election Day is somehow less than two weeks away. Early voting is underway, and you can request an absentee ballot until October 29th. If you vote by mail, be sure to send your ballot by November 4th. Ohio Politics Explained is brought to you by the USA Today Network Ohio Bureau. You can check us out on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Ohio Explained.